All right, detail who flappers were. Why were flappers viewed as taboo during the early 1920s? So taboo just means like outlandish, like unbelievable. There you go. Ryan or current event, Sarah and Matt for Friday. Oh, no, Thursday, right? Is it a Thursday? Yeah, we don't have school Friday. We do. Well, I do, I guess. Do you have to be here Friday, Miss O'Neill? I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we have an in-service day, I think. Let me check. Yeah, in-service. <laughs> Man, so yeah, have those ready to go for Thursday, the 13th. All right, so flappers. Who were flappers? Who were they? What do we got? Cassie, what do you got? Um, no. Yeah, good job, good job. So in the 1920s after World War I, women gained more opportunities, and one of them being the right to vote. What amendment was that? 19th. Yep. Good job. The 19th Amendment. So more opportunities, more independence gave women more of a, a different type of role in society. And uh, we all know that with flappers, they're wearing looser style clothing, makeup, and getting involved in these hidden bars that were, you know, in these urban areas in these cities. And what were these urban or these uh, hidden bars called during the Prohibition era? What were they called? Those hidden bars. You needed like a a code name to get in. Eddie? Speakeasies. Good job. So during that Prohibition era, when uh, the United States was really booming through the, through the roaring 20s and advancing at an alarming rate, and it gave more people more freedom, more time on their own, and increased living uh, conditions. So women, uh, especially in these urban areas, were getting involved in this different style of life, this, high, this faster pace of life, and getting involved in nightclubs, uh, well, speakeasies, wearing these different style of clothing, makeup. And uh, this changed society forever, of kind of what we know of it today, more of a modern society. And people in the rural areas, what did they view this as, these fundamentalists? Did they enjoy this? Did they, did they uh, really like this new style of living for women? Jamie? Yeah. No, why not? Because they were old school. Yeah, good job. This challenged their traditional norms, religious values. And women shouldn't be acting this way. 
They shouldn't be going out and smoking cigarettes and going out, staying up late hours of the night, uh, you know, and, and indulging in this new practice of speakeasies and forms of entertainment when they're drinking alcohol. And this is changing society overall uh, in the United States. It's no longer they just strict the households, right? So women now have the ability to seek an education, okay, have a right to vote, and now indulging this new type of behavior that's emerging with these new forms of entertainment. Obviously, with alcohol being prohibited, uh, speakeasies emerged, so they're breaking the law. And many of these fundamentalists in rural America were not appreciative of this whatsoever. They saw this change, and they were not for it at all. And they saw this as maybe like the act of the devil. So the 1920s brought on a different age, and we know as a more of a modern family, okay, no longer these families have eight, 10 children, farmhands, okay, obviously, uh, now we're changing more into an industrial society. So women uh, were working in the workplace, so secretaries, teachers, librarians, uh, jobs that weren't labor intensive, and marriage got postponed a little bit longer. Obviously, they weren't getting married in their teenage years, okay, more towards their 20s, okay, as increased independence was occurring for uh, women. All right, any questions on the flap? No? Okay, all right, terms for today. I just wanna talk about entertainment in the 1920s. Like I said, tomorrow I'll show some videos of Charlie Chaplin and Steamboat Willie. I think you guys will enjoy it. I just don't know if we'll have enough time at the end of class today. Bless you. So we got Babe Ruth, Charles Lindbergh, Spirit of St. Louis, Charlie Chaplin, jazz singer, and Steamboat Willie. <laughs> Steamboat Willie. Everybody's finding their head coach at once. Flores got fired. Zimmer got fired. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Still a shot by Flores out for Miami. I thought he was doing okay. It's his third season. Dang. Unreal. What do you think of Carr's hair? What? Oh, yeah, right. What do you think of Carr's hair? I think he needs to get a haircut here soon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, geez, a flapper, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, he doesn't want to pull his groin again, like last year. Don't say it.
All right, so we'll talk about these terms today in a lesson. I just want to talk about Chaplin, though, because I don't have him as a PowerPoint slide, but I think it's important to talk about him. But who was Charlie Chaplin? Who was he? Go ahead, Cassidy. Yeah, good job. So Charlie Chaplin, before talkies became a uh, hit thing in America where they had to use, uh, where they actually talk in movies. Uh, before that, they didn't have the ability to do that. So they just kind of acted out these skits, um, either in, in live audiences and eventually it came to films. But the tramp was his character. He would kind of act like a drunk person, just walking around, stumbling and finding himself in awkward situations. It's almost like the Three Stooges in a way, but without any dialogue, without any, uh, you know, talking within the film. So he became a hit star in the early 1900s, like uh, Cassidy was saying, he's from Great Britain. And he found himself in a lot of weird situations because America is going through World War I and uh, he was obviously an immigrant. So there is many, many cases in his films that he was kind of bashing the way America was dealing with immigration at that time. And a lot of that had to do with the Red Scare, okay? So J. Edgar Hoover, we already talked about him, okay, and how he was big about this Palmer raids and he was a government official uh, trying to seek out these communists. So this guy was always in Charlie Chaplin's grill thinking that he was trying to uh, maybe inspire communism in the United States. And then eventually when the talkies came about, Chaplin had to do something different. So there were a few skits where he actually talked and uh, where he actually got involved in the talking in his movies. But he was very famous, actually knighted by Queen Elizabeth II in Great Britain, I think right around the 1970s, which is pretty cool to think about. And it just goes to show how he was just larger than life. And he was an entertainer, uh, entertainer. And especially in the early 1900s when film was coming about, he was one of the biggest, if not the biggest stars of the decade and really for a long period of time. But he was influential through World War I, through the Roaring Twenties, the Great Depression, and World War II. Okay, he later died closer towards the Vietnam War, but he lived through all these major events in American history. And uh, he was constantly, like I said, investigated by the HUAC, which we'll talk about, and how they were trying to detain these communists from influence, uh, influencing the United States. And it's an interest, uh, he's an interesting character in how he was uh, very famous. If you get the chance, check out the movie. It's on, I think it's on HBO Max. So if you have HBO Max, it's pretty neat. Robert Downey Jr. plays him. It's pretty cool. All right. So like I said, we'll talk about these other characters today, these other people. And uh, tomorrow, I'll show you a skit of Charlie Chaplin and Steamboat Willie. So we mentioned this in chapter one with the child labor laws, but in the 1920s, because of the progressive era, because a return, a return to normalcy, it was important that the United States influence a lot of their funding, a lot of their time in education. As the United States was going through this modernistic stage and uh, with industrial revolution occurring, it was important that the US involved themselves a little bit more in education to make sure our future is bright, especially with these new trends, these new forms of innovations that are emerging because of this industrial revolution. All right, so enrollment in high schools quadrupled between 1914 and 1926. And a lot of that has to do with child labor laws, right? A lot of that has to do because our country is shifting to a more modern society. Remember, fundamentalism was taking hold uh, really because of the 18th Amendment in the early 1920s, and then eventually the Scopes trial in mid-1920s. But now, after the mid-1920s, moving to 1930s, it's important that our country uh, was more involved with education and helping with more developments and theories and sciences to adapt to this new style of living, this new society, especially forming in the Western, in the Western part of the world with this industrial revolution. So public schools met the challenge of educating millions, okay, even immigrants that were coming to the United States. All right, so news coverage, magazines, radio broadcasts were becoming prevalent in the 1920s to keep the population a little bit more well-informed, right? Yeah, it was mostly revolved around entertainment, 
So sporting events, uh, different forms of leisure activities. But for the most part, this was really just to keep everybody informed. This is really the first time we see this in American history. Yeah, there's newspapers in these urban areas, but not to the point where in the 1920s where you can broadcast a signal far distances with radio. But magazines became prevalent as well. Time Magazine, Reader's Digest, you name it. Uh, 1920s brought around a weird time, too, of leisure activities. It was to the point where people had more time on their hands because of these progressive movements, and uh, they didn't have to work 12, 16-hour shifts anymore. So with more time, they had to find different avenues, different things to do. And there's a lot of weird, uh, weird activities uh, people were indulging in. One of them was flagpole sitting. So they would climb on top of a flagpole, put a board on top, and try to sit up there as long as they can or they would dance long periods of time. It's kind of funny, there's actual videos of people trying to break records of how long they've been dancing. And there's like people just holding a person up as they're sleeping, it looks, it looks ridiculous. But uh, people would go days without sleep and constantly dancing, but the person would just kind of hold them up as they're sleeping. And the 1920s just brought a weird, weird time of many different activities that we don't even see today anymore because they're so outlandish. But again, anyway, anyway, with uh, increased time brings uh, a different society in America. So radio comes to age. Like I said, with radios, this was a way to connect the country together. Entertainment obviously was big, especially sporting events, plays, uh, different shows that were broadcasted to the American public. And uh, this is the first time where Americans sat in their living room, listened to these broadcasts, and it kind of brought a different form of family I guess you'd say luxury than what we've seen before. And we, we think about it today and how we sit in our living room with our family and maybe watch our favorite TV shows or favorite movie, whatever it might be. At uh, this time, it was a radio. So we'd sit and listen to the radio, listen to broadcasts and forms of entertainment. And eventually when we get to the Great Depression, we'll talk about fireside chats and how the US president would actually reach out to the American public and tell them exactly what type of measures are being put in place to try to benefit the American public, the American society through the Great Depression. And this will totally change how uh, really the president and government officials will reach out to the people and try to influence them or try to help them through tough times. So the radio revolutionized uh, uh, communication in the United States. You guys ever watch a Christmas story? The Oval Teen commercials? That's kind of how it was. They would just sit in the living room and listen to these Ovaltine commercials or whatever you might be. Uh, just very similar to what we do with our television. Or nowadays, I guess, our phones, which is kind of socially distancing us from this is a reality in a way, I guess. But a, two, a totally different change here with the radio, with communication. All right, Babe Ruth. So again, sports becoming prevalent, becoming big in America's pastime, baseball. What was it? So people would go to these larger cities like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and uh, go see a baseball game. And before this time, before the 1920s, this really wasn't a thing. Yeah, you might have universities or colleges having extracurricular activities as sports, but there was no, uh, let's say, major league. Uh, there was no uh, form of entertainment where people would get together and go see a game at this point. Right? And these games were broadcasted over the radio to their local, uh, local broadcasting companies. And Babe Ruth was larger than life. Uh, in many cases, people knew who Babe Ruth were, uh, knew, knew who Babe Ruth was, and not even many of the political officials or representatives that, that uh, people elected in the office. It was interesting. And even today, you can kind of think of that. Like even LeBron James today, worldwide, is well, more well known than many political officials or many important figures around the world. And just goes to show how big entertainment is, and still to this day in the United States. But Babe Ruth was the icon. He was the, I guess say, biggest figure in American society at this point. And like I said, through the prohibition in the 1920s, him and Al Capone were pretty much best buds. So whenever the Yankees were playing in Chicago, Babe Ruth would hang out with Capone. And Chaplin, same way. Chaplin was the biggest uh, film star of that time, silent film star, 
And he would often hang out with Capone too. And it just goes to show how much of an influence Capone had on American society, even though it was somewhat illegal, right? Charles Lindbergh, real quick, Charles Lindbergh was famous for flying nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. So again, getting in these activities that people would traditionally not do. And the airplane we know is a new form of technology. It was really advanced during World War I, but now already in the 1920s, just pretty much almost 20 years after the airplane was invented, he's flying nonstop across the Atlantic. And he did so in the spirit of St. Louis. So this was well known. This was broadcast across the world, across the nation. And he was one of the biggest um, key figures in American society and the world. Whoa. Well, PowerPoint fell. But one interesting fact about Lindbergh was that his son was actually captured and held for ransom because he was so big, right? His name was so big. And it's unfortunate, the story of what happened. His child was found about two months later and they believed he was stricken on the head and killed and he was kind of half buried, uh, just a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit of ways from his, his home, which is a really sad story. But it just goes to show how big of a man, uh, big of a name he was all around the world and how these people were maybe looking for some cash for taking his kids. He might have been, especially with maybe his kid getting taken from the home. Well, that's what I meant. I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know about that, but I don't know. Just because his name was so big and they thought they could maybe make some money off of taking his. And actually, Chaplin's body was taken away, too, from his burial site in Switzerland. They thought they could make some money off of his body, get it back to the burial, which is crazy. Crazy times. We had a Who? Yeah, he was a womanizer. He was a player, that guy. I'll say. All right, see you guys later.